purpose of my appearing before you here today is to tell you about a near fatal <coughs> crash which I survived back in June of 1961 and give you a few clues as to how I managed to out the grim, out with the Grim Reaper and maybe uh, help you in case you get into a comparable situation either in an airplane crash which is somewhat unlikely or more likely an automobile or a motorcycle crash. Uh, I was coming back from Colorado Springs in the back of a T-33, a tandem jet military trainer, uh, deadhead as a passenger. I wasn't jet qualified. I was a prop type pilot, but you can't spend your life in the jet age uh, going from Delaware to Colorado and back in a prop airplane. You know, you die of old age en route. <laughs> so I had about uh, 300 hours of deadheading with this real sharp pilot. He even had embroidered on the back of his orange flying suit, fly safely with the Delaware Air Guard. Uh, we landed about halfway home at St. Louis at Scott Air Force Base, and it was hot as hell, and I took my jacket off, and that was my first mistake. That denied me the additional insulation, uh, which would have minimized the burns that I got later in the crash. But I always have a jacket on when I'm flying up around those high slopes, particularly in any place, actually, uh, because if, if you had to crash ha land like the uh, famous flight surgeon, Dr. Randy Lovelace, on hot summertime, crashed in those high slopes going from Albuquerque to Colorado Springs, survived the crash, but died from lack of ex uh, jacket, died from exposure. So I always have a jacket on or with me anytime I'm flying summer or winter. Uh, we went out for takeoff and I used the checklist. I never used the checklist much in World War II. That's the war we won, in case you all forgotten when we used to do that sort of thing. <laughs> But we really can win them like we did in the desert. Uh, you know, give us the right equipment and give us a go signal, we can win them every time. But uh, uh, I always thought I knew my procedures so well, but right there on top of that uh, checklist, if you don't, re if you don't use that checklist uh, and you start omitting, getting distracted and start omitting items, that's where you really start getting into trouble. Right on the top of the back of that checklist, it says before takeoff, seat belt and shoulder harness fast and tight. Now, any time I get in any kind of a moving vehicle, airplane, automobile, or whatever, first thing I do is shut that door and fasten the seat belt. If I get in a car uh, that doesn't have a seat belt in it, uh, I sit in the back seat here behind the driver. And if he says, what are you sitting back there for? I say, because if you hit something, I want you to go through that windshield first and make a good big hole. <laughs> so when I go through, I won't get cut. <laughs> But you got to fasten that thing every time you get in that machine. I charge my kids a buck if I catch them in a car with a door shut and the seat belt not fastened, one dollar on the spot. If they don't have it, they go to work until they get it. None of, those, <laughs> none of those delayed payments or any of that foolishness. And uh, both my kids have been in bad automobile accidents and one in, a, in an airplane accident, although they're good drivers and flyers. Uh, uh, and they said the old man was sure right about seat belts that saved my life. And any time you get a teenager to admit the old man is right about anything, you know, you've made an intellectual breakthrough. <laughs> but you have to fasten that, shut that door and fasten that seat belt in that airplane or automobile and then go through the reverse process of touch the harness release here and touch the door handle because they're always all in different places. And uh, only 2% of the people get fished out of crashes or automobiles and airplanes, 98% uh, get out under their own power. So you want to know where those release things are. And fasten that uh, seat belt and shoulder harness snug, because if your body develops any momentum inside of that harness, uh, it actually doubles the stresses and everything comes unglued. And then as, make sure that your chin strap and your nape strap uh, are snug on your helmet and your visors down like if you're riding a motorcycle. How many of you all uh, ride motorcycles? Uh, oh, I got to explain to you. <clears throat> you. You may not live long enough, you know, to spend the money you save on gas. But what the big problem with the motorcycle, it's 14 times as dangerous when you go from four wheels to two. But it's coming up to that intersection when you go to make that turn and you, uh, the person looks up there and he sees a narrow silhouette, which he subconsciously relates to a pedestrian or a horse or a bicycle or something. He doesn't see the threat of that automobile, 
and he'll instinctively turn in front of it. Although he may see it, he doesn't perceive it as a threat. So when you drive that motorcycle, be sure to presume that you're invisible and that that, uh, uh, that other guy driving a car doesn't see you. And make sure, of course, that you have your visor down on uh, your motorcycle or flying uh, from uh, bird strikes in the airplane or bugs in the motorcycle. Protect those eyes because if you've ever been blind like I have for four or five days with it all black, it's a pretty darn terrifying experience. And then as a little additional precaution, although it's not on the checklist, I always made sure I could get my feet up uh, on the panel, not punching out any glass and that I could get my hands free so I could brace myself in case we ran off the end of that runway in that airplane. And people say, well, did you think you were going to crash? Well, heck no, I didn't think I was going to crash. I never got in the bloody thing. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. But there's always a possibility, and I'd rather be prepared for the worst and pleasantly surprised when I don't crash than the other way around. And I feel that way about driving out there on the highway and amongst all those people that are out to exterminate me, you know. they. Uh, be prepared for the worst. Uh, but we got off the ground, normal takeoff run, checked each other back and forth on the checklist, get, got off the ground, got the flaps up, got the gear up. About the time we got up, about 150 feet, the engine quit. No snap, no crackle, no pop, no nothing. Just quit absolutely cold. Right away we elected not to eject because 150 feet was the minimum altitude for ejection in that old T-33 with a non-rocket seat. And the Air Force has a tendency to raise the minimum of 50 feet with every unsuccessful ejection, you know. And, uh, <coughs> <coughs> we weren't uh, about to make any posthumous uh, TO revisions, so uh, we, we elected to ride it in. Now, I don't advocate riding them in. If that air engine quits you know, over the side, give it back to the taxpayer, to heck with it. And uh, if you're going to err on ejection, err on the early side. But uh, had we elected to eject, we never would have made it because we took 35 feet out, out of a 110-foot tree right off the end of the runway. And while the pilot was trying to get an air start up front, I still had a chance to yank my seat belt and shoulder harness as tight as it would go, recheck chin strap, visor down, feet up on the panel, hands up like this. Then I did something real stupid. I held my head back like that. I think you have a natural tendency when you're going to look at you can hit something, you say, geez, I can't look. And that's the worst position to have your head in, set you up to get the maximum momentum and make you break your neck. Uh, and that's, of course, augmented by the weight of the helmet. What I should have done was I should have been sort of doubled up in the embryo position. You may not remember what the embryo position is. Maybe you could ask some second lieutenant, you know, he <laughs> might, <laughs> he <laughs> might know how, how it is. But, uh, anyhow, uh, the last thing I looked, I, I was looking at the airspeed, it said 125 knots, and uh, I heard the trees at the bottom of the airplane, my head snapped forward, I got a red out as the blood rushed to my head, my helmet just rotated off my head because I hadn't adjusted the nape strap properly in that old P2 helmet, and it went completely out of the aircraft, the canopy bubble having fragmented out of the frame, and then as you get in any impact uh, with a shoulder harness, it stretches and then it slings you back. And this thing slung me back and hit this soft, squashy headrest behind which there's a metal plate, and that thing knocked me out. Now they have padded that up now so you don't have that, frangi you don't have that uh, uh, possibility of recurrence, and they put frangible material on there. You want to take a look around the uh, cockpits that you're flying in or vehicles with strange technological breakthroughs like a meat skewer for you to hang your head on in there and get it, get it padded up with some styrofoam out of an old ice chest and some masking tape. And be sure that, you, that your he headrest on your automobile is up where it's going to support the back of your neck because in that front end collision, as you'll see in these tapes on the automobiles here in a little while, when you go forward like that, you snap back if that headrest is low, that you're going to break your neck right over the top of it. It's got to be up where it's going to support the back of your neck. And same thing if you're rear-ended, when after you've survived the initial crash in that automobile, then you look in the mirror and see some guy's going to hit you from behind coming about 25 miles an hour. Then you want to put your feet up like this and head back against that headrest. Or if you don't have a headrest in the back seat, 
uh, squashed down in there so your head and neck are flat up against the seat and that car can accelerate like that and it won't uh, uh, break your neck. But as I started to come to, I had a feeling of well-being, like if you've ever been in the pressure chamber in Condon to take off your mask at the equivalent of uh, 30,000 feet and uh, all of a sudden you feel real high and then uh, you pass out. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how many of you all have done that. <laughs> a few, well I guess they pick on the generals mostly. But um, anyhow, that, that from my training, that, that warning, uh, that high feeling when I was regaining consciousness was a warning to me that I was near unconsciousness, maybe near death. So right away I was motivated to do something because when I'd been with General Patton in the 2nd Armored Division, he always said, anytime you're in a panic situation, do something. Don't sit there and frozen with terror. Do something. If you can't think of anything else, throw a fit. So the first, <laughs> the first thing I did, although I was sitting, sitting on a ruptured fuel tank and the fire is coming out from both sides, like sitting between a couple of afterburners, and uh, my cotton, old cotton flying suit's burning like a torch, my hair's crackling like a grass fire, and in spite of all that pain and chaos and confusion, the first thing I did was go for that seat belt. Uh, and I elected right away, you know, the first thing I did was go for these uh, uh, seat pins down here. Because if, if uh, you don't put these seat pins in and safety the ejection handles, then it launches you up into the trees uh, 65 feet. And, uh, which is great for getting out of the airplane uh, altitude, but on the ground, the return trip is somewhat fatal. So all, from my automatic training, right away, the first thing I did before I moved was to put, try and put these pins in. Then my logic takes over, and I realize that uh, I, they're hard enough to put in the daytime, let alone at night when you're on fire. And <laughs> so, I'm going to be a real careful not to hook, hook those handles. Now, right away, I elected to take my parachute with me, first because it's the way I'd been trained out of, to get out of the airplane, and second, uh, because uh, if your clothing's on fire, the chute's a great thing to pop and roll up in. If you see somebody with their clothing on fire and they're running, all they're doing is running through the air just like fan in the fire. You want to tackle them, knock them down, throw a coat over them, or try and beat the fire out or pop a chute. Uh, smother the fire. Uh, I went for my seat belt and I had my uh, glove on and if I hadn't had my glove on I never would have got that seat belt undone and, and I never would have burned to death in the fire unless I'd been fished out and only, as I said only 2% get fished out. Uh, but uh, without that glove on I would have been an amputee here on this arm, here on this arm and without the boots I would have been an amputee but below both knees here, and that's a quadruple amputee, and that's some kind of a vegetable that I'm not much interested in becoming. And the reason I had the boots and gloves on was because the late General Milliken, the uh, DC Air Guard commander, uh, had seen, saw a couple of our fighter jocks taxiing in, arms on the canopy rail, no gloves on, sleeves rolled up. He said, Bill, I don't usually chew out other people's troops, but I gotta give these guys a word, and told them about the Battle of Britain in World War II, they brought back the first casualties of aircraft crashes and fires, guys that hadn't been wearing boots and gloves and showed them the stumps of maimed and amputated hands and feet, much worse than anything I have. And I was so impressed by overhearing him correct some people who weren't even under his jurisdiction that I started wearing boots and gloves right then and there. And so it was thanks to him that I'm alive today. And I know he got some kind of a kick out of that because I've, you know, I've given this thing some 1,500 times and and I've got dozens of people who've uh, minimized their injuries by listening to this pitch and in many cases actually saved their lives. But what if uh, General Milliken had said, I don't want to shake up Spruance's troops. Well, I wouldn't be here today. So if you see somebody doing something wrong in your organization or somebody in your family, somebody that you love and you don't tell them, uh, you're really a contributing a factor to the accident. The little kid from the back seat that isn't strapped in that goes sailing through the front windshield to his doom and kicks you in the head on the way by, you get that on your conscience. That's the worst thing that could happen. And young people like you all are uh, smarter than we with the gray hair were at that age. And uh, given the reasons why, you'll go along with it. I had on an all leather glove, uh, better, than, better than no glove at all, 
<clears throat> but had I had on uh, the uh, Nomex glove, that leather where it hung in my hand, hung in the fire for three to five minutes, the leather shrunk on my hand and increased the conductivity of the heat and uh, reduced the circulation, made the burn a lot worse. If I'd had on this Nomex back glove, then the shrinkage of the leather uh, would have been taken up uh, by, by the uh, uh, stretch of the Nomex on the back. And th that, uh, it fits like a glove, you know, that <laughs> amazing creation. I showed this to uh, General McConnell, the late chief of staff of the Air Force, and he said, where the Navy ever, or where'd they ever get a, a glove like that? And he said, I said, well, it's a Navy glove. Oh, he said, well, that, that explains it. But you can toggle switches one at a time with this, and it's not like the old size 10 uh, gray stubby fingered ones we used to have where you could gang load about six switches at a lick with it, but you can copy the clearance with that glove on, but you have to resist the, the temptation to, to uh, strip the glove off like the V-47 co-pilot did, copied the clearance, they aborted on takeoff, the aircraft ran off the end of the runway, they blew their canopy, uh, leaped into the snow in their weather, winter flying cl clothing, and neither of them had any burns except the co-pilot looked down and his hand turned the color of a baked potato. He said he could have copied the clearance with an asbestos mitten on, you know, if he'd thought about it. So you don't want to, uh, you want to keep that glove on, particularly uh, on landings and takeoffs. Uh, and this material on the back is a special kind of synthetic. It's not, it doesn't react like normal synthetic does. This uh, RAF pilot said, what do, tell me, what do you think my flan suit's made out of? And I said, I think it looks like pure synthetic. Well, what will it do when it burns? Well, we cut a little piece out of the pant cuff, lit it, flames coming off it about this high, slap down onto the floor. I dropped it down, a liquid pool of that synthetic, and held my foot on it for a minute and pulled it up, and it just went <laughs> where that had fused into the floor and fused into my shoe, and that's what uh, synthetic will do next to your skin, and any doctor will tell you burns the worst thing you can take care of anyhow. And a, a molten, solidified synthetic is really bad news. But this is a, this Nomex is, will not support combustion at survivable temperatures. It won't fuse like that, and it's what all of our Nomex gear is made out of. Uh, I stood up and I looked in the front cockpit, and the pilot had his head down in under the panel, and he had suffered a 90 degree back break right through here, which was uh, fatal, probably because he was still flying that airplane like you'd be doing, but well, what he might have done is what this Australian had heard this pitch, and the engine quit too low to eject, cinched up his harness, chin strap visor down, hand up on the panel, feet high on the rudder pedals, and then at the, at the, kept flying that airplane, not making any low, slow turns except to avoid buildings. And uh, at the last minute, head down like this, and he walked away from one. I'll show you a picture of here directly. It was just completely totaled. You want to do the same thing if you're driving down that highway and you see you're going to have that interstate, you see you're going to have one of those five car pileups, you know, and the wheel covers are coming off and the glass is flying, the tires are smoking, and the fenders are bending. Well, you get your chin tucked in like that, keep looking for a hole, and at the last minute, head down like that. Now, don't go forward in the in the harness because you want that harness to lock you back there. And also, if you have an airbag, you don't want to be forward because that airbag, uh, is you need to go, you don't want to have that thing hit you right up close. You want to come into the airbag like that. So you want to stay back in there with your chin down. If you have no uh, airbag and, and no shoulder harness in an old car, then get up on the wheel like this, you know, and say, let us pray, you know, our Father, start working on it. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to avoid the secondary collision. This, and uh, uh, everything in there is going to go in the, in the direction of the impact. Your feet are going to swing forward like that, so put them forward ahead of time so they won't swing forward on the crossbar in an airplane or up on the firewall. And uh, your arms are going to swing forward. Your upper torso is going to swing forward unless it's restrained by that shoulder harness. And if it is, then you're going to be able to uh, have your head forward so it won't snap forward like that. Pre-position yourself where you're going to be because everything in that machine becomes a missile at the impact velocity. 
Like if you're going through a school zone at 15 miles an hour, do uh, you, you, you think you can run 15 miles an hour? Right here, you. Can you run 15 miles an hour? You know, that's a, that's a four minute mile. You might not be able to sustain that, but, but uh, if her husband's coming through the kitchen with a butcher knife, don't you think you could peek out at 15? I bet you could. But if you're looking at a good looking girl going through that school zone and all of a sudden you don't have your belt on and a little kid runs out in front of the car in front of you, you're looking at the girl, your car stops as it hits this other car that stopped for the kid and your body's still going 15 miles an hour. If you got back over here and ran just as hard as you could for that wall, that's how hard your head is going to hit in a school zone uh, with no restraint. But the average impact is uh, 35 miles an hour and the DOT statistics, which is roughly two and a half times uh, what you can run, you could run into that wall. So it's going to smart a little. Well, anyhow, I stood up and I looked over the side of the airplane and I could, my flying suit was still burning and hair crackling like a grass fire. I sat on the side of the airplane, got a first degree burn on my tail, did a non-point winning dive and, and went to the bottom and hit my head on a log. And I know it says in all the books that your life's supposed to be passing before you in one of these emergencies, but I was so darn mad hitting my head on that log. The four-letter words were bubbling up, reigniting the fuel. <laughs> and I discovered right in there and then and there with my boots and my chute on, uh, my swimming gave out on me. I went to the bottom like a stone. And unless you have adequate religious connections to walk on the top of the water, which even the generals don't have, uh, <laughs> The next best thing to do is walk on the bottom and walk uphill. And I did that till I got where I could kick off the surface and shoot to the sur kick off the bottom and shoot to the surface and do a butterfly breaststroke and knock that fire and, and oil and stuff off, and off of the top of that uh, water. Because if you take one gulp of that fire, uh, you get lung burns and that uh, you last about two weeks. In the Ramstein crash, where a couple of guys were sitting on a cot watching the fire, watching the uh, four Italians run together, the fireball rolled over the crowd. One guy dove in the ditch and held his breath, and the fireball rolled over him. The other guy looked up and said, what was that? And I went to see him in the hospital. He was dead in two weeks. So you don't want to ever inhale that fire. And when I'm riding on this airliner, I used to keep all this stuff in my carry-on luggage, but now I keep it in my jacket because I find that uh, if you're going to get off that airliner, or uh, you want to have that stuff in your pockets where you can get at it. And I, carry, I always ask for a pillow when I get on that airliner, and I carry a bungee cord in here that I can lash, lash that pillow over my face. And I've got a pair of, of uh, diver's goggles in here. and. Uh, uh, it, and a hat, and a hat, diver's goggles, and a pillow. Now, the first thing that happens in fire, whether you're in a hotel or in an airplane, is <gasps> you take a breath, and that pillow may not filter out the toxic properties, but it'll filter out the physical properties to which a lot of that toxicity adheres, and it'll cut down on the heat intake. And the next thing is you can't see, so if you've got diver's goggles, which you can buy for a couple of bucks, uh, that will protect your eyes and you're going to be able to see to get out of there and of course a hat and a pair of uh, Nomex gloves and you're in good shape. But the main thing is in any kind of a fire, don't inhale that stuff. Well, I did a butterfly breaststroke and I got up on the bank and that's where the crash crew found me about uh, 17 minutes after impact, although it was only a mile and a half off the end of the runway. And 80% of the crashes occur within two miles of the approach or over on end of that runway. And the inadequate access roads, they couldn't get in there with anything except hand-carried fire extinguishers. They started to pick me up, and the, the uh, synthetic straps of my uh, chute had all burned into, fused into my cotton flying suit. And I said, well, cut me out of it. And they didn't, nobody had a knife. Well, of course, I had a, a knife with me. Uh, I carry a knife with me uh, every place I go, because you can never tell when you're going to have an emergency or you're going to need a knife, like if they were to merge the Air National Guard into the Air Force Reserve. <laughs> Harry Carey to that one. You know, I don't think I could put up with that one. I hope there are no two-star reservists here today. <laughs> but uh, you want to carry a knife with you 
because uh, I had a knife in the leg pocket of my flying suit, but I always carry one with me, and, and I carry a flashlight, and I carry a whistle. That's one of the greatest security devices in the world. And I, I gave a bunch of whistles to the girls in the hospital when I got my annual physical a while back and, and uh, told them they have to put them on their keychains. And one of the girls came in the next morning and said that the, uh, uh, she was unlocking a door to her car with an arm full of groceries in a dark parking lot and a guy jumped her. And uh, she, all she did was go, <laughs> blew the whistle. And the guy took off. Well, I asked the police psychologist, you know, why, why did they, uh, why did he run? And he said, well, that, that subconsciously they associate that with the referee, uh, you know, re recesses over, that's a symbol of authority. They don't know whether it's a stakeout, they don't know what it is, and, but they don't want the whistle. They might want a, her uh, a tear gas gun or something like that, but, or mace, but they sure don't want her whistle. And uh, so this, if, if I see somebody or hear somebody blowing a whistle, why, gee, the first thing I do is just reach in my pocket here and, and flip out my cellular phone, you know, and start 911. There's a, a hood out here, jumped a girl in the lot, and you, the police are there. And uh, uh, if, you, if you're down in an airplane or on a hunting accident or roll your car off the highway, there's nothing like this whistle to to uh, alert people to, as to where you are. And uh, also I carry a GPS in my, <laughs> in my pocket. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and so all I do is reach down into my gear here and pull out my GPS and, and uh, call 911 and <laughs> give the Coast Guard the coordinates. And, and then you punch your home number in and say, honey, I'll be a little late for dinner. All that other survival stuff, you fishing tackle and all that, you can have it. That's Stone Age material. But uh, you can cut this whistle, and a lifeguard told me that you can multiply it by a factor of three, the range of that whistle just by cupping it. When I'm down in South Washington and in a kind of a bad area and a guy starts coming at me here, I put that whistle on my teeth and say, you don't move out. And this guy is over here, he's coming after me, two of them. I got my tear gas gun here and I can get two of them in the eyes blowing the whistle simultaneously and then the third guy hits me from behind and I'm down and I say I'm 81 years old you've broken my back and they say oh he broken his back and then I pull out the, my stun gun here and start taking him out at the knees but for a nominal fee see you can wait for the crime bill if you want but I'd, I'd rather go ahead and be prepared <clears throat> But anyhow, I got up on the bank and, and uh, they put me in the ambulance and about that, uh, at that, that time this seat went off and launched that 190 pound seat up into the trees. And I said, gee, if anybody's got any connections with the front office, say a short prayer that that darn seat doesn't come through the roof of this ambulance and kill us all because I've had enough trouble with that airplane for one day. And sure enough, they had a Catholic chaplain on there. They gave me the last rites of the Catholic church I had told me the next morning, and I said, well, that's the reason I survived, I guess, because I'm a Presbyterian, and it didn't take. <laughs> but sorry for you Catholics to laugh at that. I got you special dispensation. But uh, don't ever sell those chaplains short, because in the 36 major operations I had in that hospital, uh, lots of times going into that OR, it was, uh, odds were 1 in 10 I was going to survive. And when they get that slim, it's pretty nice to have a chaplain come in and say a little prayer in front of the doctors and nurses, sort or of to get everybody on the same frequency in the operating room. And, and when it comes to praying, I want somebody who's f fully checked out and qualified and operationally ready and all that sort of thing. But uh, after the first four days, uh, when they realized I wasn't going to agree with them when they kept pronouncing me dead, and that's the only time I disagree with the doctors. I don't go along with that pronouncing you dead routine, not that I'm afraid of dying, because when I was with uh, Red and Peter Pan when I was a kid, that's a wonderful adventure someplace I've never been before. Uh, but I'm not sure where I'm going, so I'm going to do my best to stick around. And the doctor wants you to stick around, because if all his patients are going out the back door in, the, in a hearse, uh, you know, and loading into a coffin, why, that's... Uh, uh, not very good for his reputation. He wants you to go out and tell everybody what a great doctor he is, and then he gets more promotions or better 
more patients or whatnot, and you want to get out of that hospital because they smell something frightful and don't have any bars in them. There's just no place to be volunteering to spend a lot of time. So think positive and have the people around you. I, when, I, when I was critical, lying in a, in a bed with a tent over top of me, nothing could touch me at all. And uh, I, had, uh, I couldn't move, I couldn't talk, I had a tracheostomy here. And I heard a guy out in the hall say he's not going to make it. Well, if that had been somebody I knew, I probably would have uh, given up, you know, if it had been my doctor. But these people were positive, and I could have spent, uh, I guess, a couple hundred thousand dollars in the first year on surgical fees alone and never got the care that I got in the uh, Air Force uh, medical system. They air vac me down to San Antonio, and it was nice to get back in the air again. <coughs> but uh, <laughs> there I had the fabulous care of those doctors. And the first problem was I had a wraparound burn on my arm. And any time you have a wraparound third degree burn on your arm, why, it, they just have to amputate. It cuts off the circulation. They said they had a guy had a wraparound burn on his finger. And, and they put it in a pouch in his abdomen that fed the finger till the old supply restored itself. And then they pulled it out and wrapped a skin graft around. The guy's got a pretty good working finger. They said, how would you like to try that with your arm? I said, I don't know. Have you guys ever done this before? And they said, no. And I said, well, that's not much of a testimonial. Uh, <laughs> what else you got in mind? And they said, well, you could cut your arm off. And I said, well, that's the easiest decision of my career. You know, what have I got to lose? So. Uh, uh, they made an incision in my abdomen, put my hand in there, and that fed the arm and everything. And it was just like having your hand in your pocket, but a month, it, a month is a long time to have your hand in your pocket. And then they, they pulled it out and wrapped a skin graft around it, and they took skin from me all over. In fact, there's one expression I never use anymore. It's no skin off my, uh, <laughs> never use that one. But uh, <clears throat> I got a pretty good working hand here. I can't. I can shoot ducks, you know, and I can, and I can, uh, cra I can crank a fishing reel. I, I caught a 140-pound tarpon, uh, six-foot-six fish by myself, no captain, no mate, no uh, witnesses, no <laughs> honest face like mine. I really did, uh, but that was 12 years after the accident, so you get a little better every time or every year, but. Uh, I can't hold a highball glass in this hand, but I can, uh, I can hold one in this hand. And that isn't a highball. I think that's a chlorine flip. But uh, I can hold a champagne glass in this hand. So if I have to drink with my left hand, you know, I have to make some adjustments to this. But I can't do a thing with paperwork. I have a controllable disability. It quits on me. I have some pictures here which I stole out of the accident file to show you the what you can get away with making a minimum of mistakes, and also to show you some pictures of some other people that have heard just what you've heard here today <clears throat> and how it uh, minimized their injuries and in some cases uh, actually saved their lives. So the first slide, there's a scene of the crash, and he landed that airplane uh, just like it says in the book, uh, no, no low, slow turns. If we'd gone uh, for this sucker field over here on the right, we'd have cartwheeled and bought the farm for sure. But we we're right on that uh, runway heading, uh, runway uh, one three, and uh, took 35 feet out of a 110 foot tree right off the end of the runway, cut an 800 foot swath, uh, and uh, landed in that, that creek right there. And the, uh, that's the tail up there on the bank, and this, this is the tail, this is the engine, and I was in the middle of that fuselage laying there in the water, uh, something in excess of 15 minutes, maybe 20 Gs. I had no impact injuries except that whack in the head from losing that ill-fitting hel helmet and not having a padded up headrest, but no broken bones, nothing else but the, the burns. Uh, they immediately, this is the engine, and they immediately took, took that apart and determined the cause of the failure of the accident was a fatigue break in the linkage in the fuel controller system. So they uh, grounded all airplanes with that type fuel system for a one-time inspection to be sure it wasn't going to happen to some other guy. Uh, and if we had had the gang start modification, we would have had no sweat. Uh, <clears throat> we had, but this fatigue break in the uh, linkage in that system uh, would never have happened. So uh, we had the paperwork on 
the modification, uh, we got the parts two weeks after the accident. So that, that had been expedited by two weeks, uh, cut through that higher headquarters of the exigencies of the situation, preclude the economical feasible modification, which is bureaucratese for I don't understand it, I don't want to make a decision, and I'm waiting for retirement. <coughs> if we, that had been expedited by two weeks, the pilot's uh, five kids would still have a father. So when you're fooling with uh, safety items, uh, you're really in a race against time and something that is a matter of life and death. And here's the engine up here on the bank having broken off from behind me, sitting here in the remnants of Delaware Air Guard painted on the side of the aircraft. I'm a great believer in painting the name of your outfit on the side of your aircraft and your automobiles and vehicles and every, everything is good for uh, recruiting and that sort of thing. But uh, when you have a crash, uh, you always get on the front page of the local paper and then you get famous for having crashes with your name on a wreck. So the first thing to do is get out there and get the survivors out and then get the paint remover and take your name off of there. <laughs> paint on their Iraqi Air Force or something like that, or the U.S. Navy or something. <laughs> I almost got thrown off a carrier for saying that one time. Quite a bit of fire damage due to the fact they couldn't get in with anything but hand-carried fire extinguishers. Had we had a, a chopper with a bottle, uh, we'd had no sweat. Talking to this rescue guy over in Thailand, I said, what can I tell people around airplanes that'll improve your odds in uh, uh, saving their lives? And he said, the, the uh, uh, thing that bugs us most in the rescue business is sitting there in the firehouse, bored to death, and all of a sudden you look up and there's a burning airplane in the middle of the runway and it takes us three to five minutes to get out there. Whereas if we had, you had declared an emergency, we could have had the fire trucks strung out down the runway, had the, uh, the helicopter uh, hovering, and maybe could have got that uh, fire out before it even uh, got lit. Uh, because it's only a matter of uh, three to five uh, minutes before you, you go from a flash burn like a sunburn to a second, third, or a fatal uh, degree of burn. When I went over the side of that airplane, I had a perfect mental picture of this page out of this old World War II training manual, which I know I hadn't looked at for at least 15 years, and I've got a lousy memory. I can't remember anything on there now except swimming through fire, but I remember that picture. I can remember that guy doing that butterfly breaststroke. And if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't seen that page, uh, I, I would have taken a gulp of fire and I wouldn't be here today. So that page saved my life. So you want to read all the horror publications that you can possibly get your hands on. And one page, all the accident reports, and one page might save your life uh, like that saved mine. As it was, uh, I did have some lung damage. And the anesthesiologist said, uh, and some of those five-hour operations were uh, of anesthetic of the 36. Uh, there's a heck of a strain on your lungs. And I'd, he said, if I'd been a heavy smoker, uh, that I never would have survived. I quit smoking in 1940, and I had about 20 years to get that crud and stuff out of my lungs. Because when you're uh, smoking on, on one of those cigarettes, you're taking in carbon monoxide, which is a poisonous gas, the nicotine, the tar, the smoke and the cancer-producing substances. And what it's basically doing is carbon monoxide is depriving your brain of oxygen. So it's really uh, reducing your smarts factors. And particularly in flying high-performance airplanes and driving out on the highways today, you need all the smarts factors you can get. And the, the nicotine actually constricts the blood vessels. And I started smoking when I was five years old. You know, I know what that high feeling is from smoking those cigarettes. And uh, it uh, is actually a taking the blood from your, vein, uh, your brain and stupefying you. The smoke is three times as suffocating as the Environmental Protection Agency's standards for air pollution. In the airliners, before they put the smoking ban on, it was 50 times the EPA standards, 50 times. And when you're smoking, if a, a wife and, and a husband are smoking around with little crumb crunchers and rug rats, you know, they're running around the floor, and they're inhaling that secondary stuff. The British found out years ago that it would make them uh, catch more colds and they'd give them trouble uh, getting over them. And now they've found that it actually reduces the brain development of the children to be inhaling that ambient uh, smoke. So when a little kid comes to you and says, Daddy, help me with your homework, if you, he's half full of smoke and stupefied, you know, if you hadn't done that to him, he probably would have been able to figure it out for himself. 
you wouldn't have to help him even. Uh, and it, it chronically, it'll cause a chronic lung damage. My late wife, uh, we t she didn't feel very well, and she smoked, and she didn't feel very well, and so we took her to a, uh, a three major medical centers for her annual physical, and couldn't no could find anything wrong with her. The next year, first physical squamous cell and operable terminal lung cancer. And to see her go with the radiation treatments and the chemo and all the rest of it, and 14 months later she couldn't get her breath and uh, died, and, and her grandchildren have no grandmother and, uh, from, from smoking those damn things. So they're really bad news. So uh, that they produce cancer that destroys the mouth, throat, and lungs, and it should say heart, because 90% of the heart problems are smoking-induced. So when that, that uh, uh, doctor says, quit smoking, even if he's got a cigarette hanging out of the corner of his mouth, quit smoking. If he says, quit drinking, get a fresh doctor. <laughs> but you have to watch that drinking, that designated driver is the only way to go. I was, I was going to a party one time, somebody whacked me in the side, the whole side of the car crumped in, the seat buckled and projected me towards the ceiling, and that uh, shoulder harness locked so fast, I never touched the top of the roof, I never touched the sidewall of the car, and it was completely demolished. And I walked out over to the, the trooper, came up and said, well, have you been drinking? And I walked up about that far from him and said, hell no, because I didn't want to have to take the breath test. And I've got one of those bar, uh, one of those uh, uh, analyzers, breath analyzers on my bar, and it takes very, very little to push that thing over 0 0.08. And uh, uh, if I'd been coming from that party, I probably would have been in jail for good, because those mothers out, out there are really mad. So uh, you want to have the, that designated driver is the only way to go. This is what I looked like three weeks after the accident, after the swelling had gone down, a little grafting on my shoulder here, rebuilt my nose. But it's hard to believe that with the care that I got from the Air Force and uh, that, that I could uh, recover from that. And uh, the, this is what my arm looked like when it was implanted, and here's where it was burnt to the bone, and that's a hell of a looking picture too. But this fellow here had seen this picture, and although it was a real hot day, he remembered I was burned like that because I didn't have a jacket on. And he uh, sheared the nose gear on takeoff, out in the overrun, leaped over the side, hadn't practiced getting over the, out of the airplane, and fell in the fire, burned the sleeves completely out of his jacket, but had no arm injuries at all. And the flight surgeon said he, if he hadn't had that jacket on, he would have been a double arm amputee. You see how far you'd get with no arms, and that's a heck of a lot uh, worse uh, than just the temporary shock of uh, looking at that picture. And here's another guy that had the same kind of sleeve burns I have, had no gloves on, got permanent constrictions in his fingers, he'll never fly again, a lot of other things he'll never do again, whereas this fellow with the same kind of sleeve burns had gloves on, he's back flying airplanes, uh, no problem at all. This guy in an F-111 had practiced getting out of the airplane, or had practiced getting out of the simulator, but not, was not familiar with the fittings in the 111 and had to strip his glove off on the right hand and you see the distal joints amputated and the frozen joints and everything, whereas the gloved hand is in uh, perfect uh, shape. <clears throat> this guy's got uh, gloves on, but he's got bare arms, so if he gets into a mild fire, his hands will be okay, but if uh, he gets in a bad fire, you know, his hands will be okay, but they just won't be hooked up to anything. Two guys lost their hands in the uh, from rolling up their glove, or rolling down their uh, gauntlet of the glove and the sleeve up to look at their watch. So you want to, the purpose of the overlap of that gauntlet and sleeve is so that under stress when your sleeve rides up, you're still going to get full wraparound coverage. This is a Daytona car racer, uh, had everything going for him, the roll bar, seat belt, shoulder harness and everything, except he forgot his gloves. And you can see uh, what it did uh, to his hands. This is the safest aircraft we've probably ever had in the Air Force, the C-141. This one was taxied out into the path of a Marine A-6 uh, bomb loaded on the takeoff roll, and everybody got killed up front in the, in the 
141, the loadmaster was back here flubbing around with the door. He held his breath, and uh, he, he was the sole survivor of that. But the two guys in the A6, one of them's Fred M. Cohn, uh, an instructor out at Embry-Riddle at Prescott, Arizona, wound up uh, hanging upside down in that wreckage, and they attributed their survival, among other things, to the fact that they had on the Nomex gear. And these, this was back uh, in the Vietnam War, uh, and they would not fly without uh, Nomex. And here in another uh, fire, this guy was in a so-called uncomfortable Nomex. This fell in the comfortable cotton, and he uh, obviously was pretty uncomfortable in the hospital with those burns. Don't get around structural fires like this. All it takes is a can of shaving foam or a bug bomb or any kind of pressurized can to redistribute that raw burning fuel all over the bare skin areas of all these people, except the asbestos clad firefighter. If there are survivors in there, you can take a chance. If there are no survivors, uh, let the firemen uh, take care of it. And keep yourself clean because the bacteria that gets into your clothing and, or that's in your clothing or on your skin at the time that you're burned is what uh, is a major source of infection. I'd taken a shower that morning, put on a reasonably clean flying suit and uh, a uh, clean undershirt, and if I hadn't, the additional bacteria uh, would have wiped me out for sure. And this is a guy doing everything wrong. He's got a dangling chin strap, he's got his visor up, he's got a synthetic scarf, he's got his sleeves cut off so he can't even roll them down in emergency. He's got a no jacket and uh, uh, no gloves. <clears throat> Get used to flying with your collar up protect the back of the neck, as the late Colonel Bill Jones, a Medal of Honor winner, said, General, take my picture and show it to people around airplanes and tell them if I'd only had my collar turned up, uh, that I wouldn't have gotten burned like that on the back of my neck. So have that collar turned up and have that nape strap adjusted so you won't lose that helmet uh, like I lost mine. Because if you lose your helmet on initial impact, like this guy did, he was killed in the same accident with these other fellows. And this one lost it on secondary impact and survived, uh, but went to hospital, the two on the ends of the same crash, helmet retained, no head injuries at all. So when you're riding that motorcycle, wear, wear a helmet, wear some gloves, wear long sleeves, and wear some leather, and be 14 times as careful as going in a four-wheel car. Uh, on an impact sled, you can see the neck breaks, uh, is snapping forward as the guy decelerates. So the, the chance of least breaking your neck is stretching it that way and snapping it forwards the next best way to break it and over the back like that you'll break it every time or get paralysis that's uh, that's for sure uh, but you got to be aware of that tailgater and as i told you brace yourself uh, so that your head and neck are up against that seat and don't poke your head out through that back windshield uh, because a lot of accidents occur, whiplash, just from rear end collisions, which are easily preventable if you don't turn around to look to see what's coming, just automatically go in that position. And this fellow rolled uh, three times in his car when he punched a uh, left tire with a piece of jagged metal in that wet, muddy road and rolled three times over into the woods. And he's an Embry-Riddle instructor at Daytona and said that if he'd been in the Jesus I can't look position with his head up, when that roof came down, it would have crushed his skull and killed him for sure. He had uh, 15 years of uh, flying and had always worn a lap belt and uh, about, uh, oh, I don't know, he'd been driving for four or five years and always wore a lap belt but never wore a, a, a shoulder harness until he heard this pitch. And that harness, he said, as he was decelerating, rolling, he could feel that thing cutting into him and he was hoping it wouldn't fail. And uh, he wound up upside down, turned the switch off right away because you know that Volkswagen with the tank in front, that's Hitler's revenge. Uh, you gotta cut that switch off so it won't ignite on you. And he did not do what another friend of mine did. He was upside down and, and uh, undid his belt, put there, broke his neck. You, what you do is you put your hand up there first and then undo the belt. And if you're upside down in water or anything and uh, before you get disoriented and undo that belt, you want to jettison the door handles uh, so before you get disoriented. And uh, he was at, the impact was such that we, the front seat was laying out in the woods. We put it back in there. I couldn't believe it had torn out of there. If the 
if the kids, if he hadn't had been belted in, he would have been projected right out through with a seat. Uh, if the kids had been in there, they'd have gone out to their doom because there were kids' toys all over in the woods. And uh, so you want to belt your kids, belt them regularly. It may save their lives. And you start these little crumb crunchers off in one of these love seats, and you, and you uh, uh, don't want to have them uh, facing uh, aft in a, uh, uh, with an airbag, because if they're, if, they're facing, if they're facing aft in an airbag, uh, it will, that airbag will project them right backward like that. Uh, you want to put those little kids in the back seat, or if you have to put them in the front, uh, have them facing forward. And they don't know whether they're going forward or backwards. They're just as happy going either way. And you ask these kids, uh, how do you feel about seat belts and shoulder harnesses? And they said, well, geez, I've been wearing them all my life. What's your hang up? And uh, what he can't understand is why we don't have seat belts in the school buses. Here we try and train our, uh, educate our kids to be successful citizens. And then we don't uh, uh, have seat belts in the school buses where they're going to get educated. And the academic people say, well, uh, we don't kill enough people in school buses. Well, we don't kill enough people in the chem lab. Shall we take out the fire extinguishers? You know, I think we should train them to associate uh, restraint with motion from the womb to the tomb. And this is our, one of our air guard photographers having uh, the, uh, it's, they say it's just unacceptable for them to risk the chance of hitting a 35 miles an hour versus, and going out through that front windshield versus uh, that temporary con uh, con restraint system. And here again, you don't want to have them facing aft at the, if there's an airbag there. <clears throat> this is my son's Oldsmobile 442, which he totaled which he slipped, when he slipped off his high crown tar uh, road. And uh, uh, he hit a bush, which turned out to be stuffed with that concrete. <laughs> you can see what that does to a, a a front engine car, if you had a rear engine car, you get the double whammy, you know, you hit the abutment and then the engine just hits you four times as dangerous to ride in a rear engine car. The guy in the right seat uh, had no seat belt on, no shoulder harness, he bit a piece out of the panel, here's where his head went in the glass, he was knocked intermittently unconscious, unconscious for uh, a couple of months and that was the tragedy of it, Tom had to look after him, then we discovered that was the third accident that he'd been in without a seat belt. And he's pretty hard to convince. I had trouble convincing my late wife. She said, I don't want to wear that seat belt because it's going to bust my dress. And I said, well, if you stick your pretty face in that glass, uh, you're going to get some wrinkles in your face and I'm not going to be able to press out. And so we got her pretty well convinced on that. She wore it all the time and Tom uh, wore his uh, all the time. And uh, uh, when he hit in the old convertible with no shoulder harness, why? He slammed into that column and it, it uh, collapsed as designed. You could hit up to about 50 miles an hour with a collapsible column and uh, uh, no chance of fatality. You add the shoulder harness to that and you're up to about uh, 60. Now both these guys said that they were going uh, uh, around 35 miles an hour and this tape, uh, I asked the Ford Motor Company to, do you think they were going 35? And he said, well, uh, you take a look at this tape and you figure whether you think they were going 35 miles an hour or not. And this is the tape that they showed me. You don't have to change the projector. That's, that, that's so, just the, the videotape. There we go.
I'll be turning now to our very class, and the occupants of the car are under the stage. The last year, coming in Alaska, the very little bit of the The man on the right here coming, he flies up to the front of the car. The right front passenger is also under the stage. Now that's a scientifically weighted dummy has already been from the back seat to the front windshield and now going to the back window at 30 miles an hour. And uh, so anybody says you don't need a belt in the back is, doesn't know what they're talking about. In this next crash test, both the right front and left front dummy also do not have this brake system. Note the use of the onboard IC camera. They're used for a close-up study of the motion of the dummy. In this particular test, the windshield was contacted and bulged, but did not break into lacerating sharp fragments, a feature of the type of safety class that is in all of the windshield. See him impacting the headrest? It's an average class that has a lap belted and shoulder harness right front occupant. The doors are removed and braced to allow a better view. Note how effectively he is restrained and does not contact the front part of the car. This next crash is a motion for the right front airbag system upper torso restraint. The dummy is black balanced. The bag is placed when the crash sensor detects a severe impact, and the dummy impacts the bag prior to movement into the panel area. See that headrest going back? This next test is a 30 mile per hour, 30 degree head on accident simulation, with both cars moving at the same speed. Both cars were equipped with an airbag restraint system. The bag inflated early enough to keep the occupants from further contact with any other forward portion of the car. The need for valve systems is dramatically demonstrated in this next sequence of 50 mile per hour rollover test. The car is intentionally rolled by towing it over the ramp 50 miles per hour. In the first <coughs> test, the occupants have no restraints and the windows are intentionally left open. As the car hits the turf and the roll of the sea, the right front passenger is ejected through the open window. Ejection from the vehicle is one of the most serious causes of fatal and serious injuries in accidents. That's called being thrown clear, in case you prefer that to stay in. in. Here is the same type of test with an airbag system, and yet still without any other valve restraint. Again, the ejection occurs, and the airbag is ineffective in keeping the occupant in the car in this type of rollover test. As before, the windows were left open. The doors, due to improved glass systems over many years of development, stay closed. Yet the open windows provide sufficient area for ejection of the unwelcome. Four times as dangerous to get thrown out as a ride with it. The third in the sequence is an example of the same rollover test with passengers who have been restrained by a lap shoulder belt. Again, the window is left open. The car rolls violently yet the occupants are contained within the vehicle. Evidence has shown that the likelihood of serious injury or death is reduced if you are kept within the vehicle during an accident involving a roll. And you have to wear that lap belt even though you have an automatic shoulder harness or an airbag or anything else, you still have to have that, that lap belt on uh, to keep from eject getting ejected out of that machine. And this uh, is a old airbag picture, one of the first ones. This guy rolled, fell asleep, rolled three times at 65 miles an hour, and the police went to dig out the body, and he was out picking up his paperwork out in front because the briefcase wasn't strapped in, and it, papers are all over the place, and he's back at work uh, the next day. <clears throat> in the case of the Volkswagen, had he had not had that uh, shoulder harness on, he would have impaled his heart on that column stuck a horn ring in his teeth and stuck his head into the windshield. But with the harness pulling him off of that, he has no 
a problem like that. Now, people say, well, I don't want to have that harness and everything on because if I go on water or fire, you know, I'll drown or burn to death. Problem is, if you don't have that harness on, you get knocked out, then you're sure going to drown or burn to death. One chance out of 30, the, the harness will do you more harm than good. 29 times out of 30, it's going to save your life. <clears throat> this is a general aviation air, uh, cockpit superimposed on each other, shows the body slamming forward, legs and arms forward uh, without uh, the harness. And if you don't have a shoulder harness in an old car or any kind of an old airplane, uh, get uh, 10 feet of webbing and sew a loop with heavy cord in each end and then thread that through your rear seat belt or tie it back there, put your front seat belt through those two loops and therefore a couple of bucks, you've upped your odds about uh, 80 percent uh, for survival. <clears throat> I'm always asked where to sit, whether f face forward or face aft. Well, this aft-facing seat will tear out at this forward point with the leverage uh, at uh, 12 G's, whereas this seat will tear out at 20 G's. So if I'm facing forward, uh, unless there's a bulkhead there, if there's a bulkhead, uh, then that's fine. Uh, then it's, I'd prefer an half-facing seat, and the military aircraft uh, reinforce the floor structure, so that's good for about 20 Gs, too. Uh, I'm always, but uh, this fella, saw, fella saw this picture right here and uh, went into this, picked into this position, putting his feet up so they're not on, down below there where they're going to get broken by the crossbar, as happened in five guys broke their legs in another airplane. Uh, he went in that position, and at the, uh, the guy sitting next to him said, uh, what, was, what was all that noise as they went out in the overrun? And they never saw him again. And this fellow uh, that was in that position was one of the heroes who helped extricate uh, people out of that, uh, <coughs> out of that uh, wrecked airplane up in Anchorage. And when I'm riding an airliner, I watch that white line on the outside. If that line goes shoom underneath of me or zing out that way, I know we're going off that runway and uh, I go into that position right away. This fellow was in the Pango Pango crash uh, and uh, they started to they hit a wind shear and as they started to gyrate, he went into that position right away. They hit, bounced, and uh, it was at night and a lot of people thought that that was the final landing. And there were bodies flying all over, they undid their belts and their bodies flying all over the place. He stayed strapped in, went forward. Usually the, uh, the fire is aft. In this case, a ruptured fuel tank fire went forward. He got a whiff, went up into the first class, got a whiff of the phosgene and cyanide gases from the decomposition of the burning plastics. But he was a Navy uh, uh, di or an Olympic diving coach and he could hold his breath in terminal late at the time. He back, opened this exit and ran off, jumped off the wing, and he was the only guy in 101 people in that aircraft that didn't have toxic deposits in his lungs. Uh, there were two people sitting alongside of Dick, and he said they had never been in an airplane before in their lives. They read all the, the uh, uh, exit uh, regress procedures, and they did everything right, and they survived, whereas uh, 97 seasoned travelers went to their doom because uh, they didn't read the uh, egress cards and, uh, th and, and think ahead of time. There we go. I heard him talk at the Crash Survival Investigator School at Tempe, if you ever get a chance to uh, go to that, why it's, uh, it's really well, well worth it. There we go. Uh, we're, we're improving uh, the masks now. This is a Teflon mask that has a uh, window so you can see out of it, and that little white gadget is a filter to cut down on the uh, carbon monoxide and, and uh, uh, supply oxygen, good for 17 minutes. Have them on a lot of airplanes down. Some guys take them to the hotels, you know. 17 minutes is a big, uh, a lot of help getting out of those things. Uh, I'm always asked where to sit. Uh, the pilot and the first officer got the worst seat in the house. Uh, they get killed first, but they get paid for it. And they're the first to arrive at the scene of the accident, they say. I always <laughs> uh, then you go first class, get killed first, and go coach and arrive alive. So uh, the best place to sit uh, is in the, don't be telling everybody this now, but is in an 
aisle seat and the over row, overwing exit row because although the aircraft will tends to break up in the fr front first, it or separate from the wings there, and se tail separates there, structurally the strongest part of the airplane is that uh, wing area, and although you're sitting over fuel, the fuel is usually aft, and that gives you an option of forward, uh, rear, or out either side, whichever one uh, seems to have the, <clears throat> the least fire. This guy, if he'd gone out, he, he did go out over the nose, all the fire was aft, and had uh, no problem at all. This fellow, uh, you, hang by his hands. You don't want to jump off a high wing, break your leg in case that airplane's going to blow up. You want to hang by your hands and so you won't hurt, hurt yourself. And this is a completely impossible picture here. Here's this girl going down this slide in a skirt, and that skirt is going to be zing right over her backside, and she's going to be going at twice the speed of light down that um, mat there and getting a smoke and burn. Uh, from not having slacks and flats on, because you want to wear, uh, don't wear short skirts, you girls, and don't wear uh, spikes, because it's the spikes, if they don't puncture the Teflon slide, they're at least, they have to hook, and you'll tumble, break your neck at the bottom, and uh, the flat, the, the uh, slacks will, are the only way to, the only way to go. Uh, my wife's a pretty classy lady, she didn't like to wear flats and slacks, but she wears them when she gets on that airplane, and when she gets off, we're going to a party or something, while she uh, changes her clothes, has something in her carry-on luggage. Uh, but if you wind up uh, without your shoes, you want to wear functional shoes, because these, uh, in this aircraft, they took all the shoes off the people, and they were running around in their bare feet in this jagged metal and splinters, and and uh, uh, embers and, and everything else. After this accident, they changed the rules and, and uh, now you're, uh, you're allowed to wear any kind of shoes except uh, uh, the spikes. And if you were to step out there on a hot ramp in the winter, in the summertime, you know, the nylons are just, with no shoes, uh, those nylons will just fuse right into your foot with a ramp temperature of 130 degrees or so. Uh, and, and in the winter time, it's obvious that you need a jacket. Uh, this is the Air Florida crash, and to go into nice warm Tampa, but it didn't. Uh, well, it certainly wasn't very very comfortable for those guys that were in shorts. Uh, this, you're not supposed to uh, have to know, have life jackets in, and if you're going to be less than 50 miles offshore, yet this aircraft was on the tail was still on the runway and a couple of guys drowned here because uh, they didn't know where the life jackets were, didn't know how to uh, use the cushion. I always reach underneath and if there's a life jacket there, I know I'm not going to use that cushion. I don't want to swim any 49.9 miles with a cushion. I'd rather uh, use the jacket if there's one there. DC-9s or the uh, uh, MD-80s, uh, there's an extra exit which uh, most people don't, don't realize where, where it is. And if you haven't read your instructions and you're back here in the back, uh, there'll be a lot of people trying to get out the front because that's the way they came in. But if you read the instructions, you undo that handle there and uh, 16 pins fall out, the tail uh, cone falls off, the slide deploys and you're home free. Now, whose fault is it that you probably haven't read that? Well, it's a little bit your own, a little bit the marketing people who don't want to scare people. But I think that most people want to know how to get out of that airplane uh, in case uh, something happens. It's 200 times as safe per passenger mile riding in one of those airliners as it is uh, driving in a car. But this guy here had an extra pin in his seat belt, and uh, uh, they didn't check him out on how to work that while he was taking these pictures an old Navy gunner's belt. And when they flew over and threw a blade flap and crumped in the water right in front of me while I was taking these pictures, the guys came up, and everybody except the photographer that had that extra pin in his seat belt. And he, uh, uh, these guys couldn't get it undone. And the pararescue man stand alongside of me on the, on the uh, boat, threw his wallet on the deck, put on a face mask, and uh, dove over the side. And he cut the guy loose with a knife 
out of his belt. And here he's giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. This guy's pounding his heart, giving him heart massage. And this fellow's giving him uh, flotation. And they got him up on the deck, and he's back at work again. Or his uh, color was beginning to come back. His camera's still on there, heartbeat stabilizing. And they carted him off to the hospital, and he was back at work in a couple of days. But whose fault was that? Well, a little bit the air crew. But mostly the guy himself had said, how am I going to get out of this thing in case something happens? Uh, like this uh, uh, fellow here had heard my pitch, and he said, it, as he pantomimed afterwards, his uh, shoulder harness failed, his inertia reel failed, and he slammed into this panel. And he said if he hadn't had his uh, dark glasses on, or if he hadn't had his visor on, he would have got those dark glasses in the eye and been blinded for life. And uh, he bounced off the armor plate and got a hole in his helmet, but not in his head because his helmet fit properly. And he was out of that aircraft in less than the uh, four seconds he said that he'd practice with his crew. And I said, you can't get out of there in four seconds. And so I clocked him. Darn if he didn't get out of there in four seconds. So I ride these things a lot. So I said, well, clock me with the crew. Well, the f they said, go, and the helmet cord's over here in my seat belt is hooked into my survival gear and I'm fumbling and mumbling and these guys trampled me to death. But the next time when I'd done that, practiced it once, they said go, I hit that belt and hit that cord and I was first out of that thing. Because I do not believe in that Navy theory of the senior officer is the last man to leave the ship. I, I believe in the follow me man, the Army theory, <laughs> we're going this way, out of this right now. You get out of any kind of a helicopter or any kind of a general aviation airplane with lightweight plexiglass, non-pressurized, you can kick your way out of it. Don't ever get trapped. But if uh, it's pressurized, you're going to need a canopy braking tool. But remember, don't remember these rotors still coast. This fellow forgot that the survived the crash, but the rotors still coasting, and uh, there's his head where it got lopped off by the rotor. And here's 60 whirling meat cleavers of our Delaware Air Guard C-130s. I won't even walk in the path of a prop, even if it's sitting on a prop stand and not on an engine. I don't want to ever expose myself to that. Like a fellow in another outfit got out of the airplane, said, good night, fellas, thanks for the ride. Raining, ran for the hangar, ran right into the prop and sunk it right in the top of his head. Here's a, a guy shooting coyotes out in the desert with a, a uh, <coughs> a light airplane, didn't have a shoulder harness on, stalled in probably 35 miles an hour, and that's what his face looked like in the morgue. That's a pretty ghastly looking picture. I don't like to look at that either, but we show that to our guys and gals down at Embry-Riddle to show them if they're sitting there looking at that instrument light and sit the ground through circumstances beyond their control and don't have that harness on, that instrument light will make a lasting impression in their head. And that's a pretty ghastly looking picture too, but if that's the best instructor we have and that's the best student we have, and I can shock him with that to wearing that harness, uh, then uh, I say it's still it's, uh, well worth it. And that's the kind of realistic technique we use at Embry-Riddle at our campuses at Daytona, Prescott, Arizona, and our extended campus where you could get uh, a master's degree at 125 residence centers, or best ROTC in the country, highest success rate, uh, you can't get in the academy or get a guard slot. Uh, this is uh, really the best way to go uh, Air Force. And this uh, is the kind of realistic training I'm giving you right now. This is the airplane I got out of. This is the type of glove I had on. I had on that all leather glove, better than no glove at all. But had I had my Nomex glove, I wouldn't have had that problem. This is the checklist that was dug out of the uh, wreckage uh, afterwards, seat belt, shoulder, shoulder harness fastened. There are the gloves. And uh, this fella, it's helped a few people. Like this fella uh, ran off the end of the runway, still going like hell, said he might as well brace himself, like that general said in that lecture a while back. Hit so hard the canopy jammed, he took a canopy braking tool and punched a hole through there. And this guy here went out through that hole. And he said he couldn't go back through there again for a million dollars. But when you're scared and that uh, adrenaline uh, lights your afterburner, well, you can just launch like a rocket right out of one of those things. And here's the, uh, the Australian I was telling you about. Here's the gear in the foreground, nose all bashed in. First time he practiced getting out of that airplane was 
took him t uh, 20 seconds. And he said the fourth time uh, he was down to five seconds. And when he actually crashed, he cut that time in half. And this guy uh, was a loadmaster in the back of a C-130, didn't want to sit in front of the cargo, didn't even have a belt back here, doubled up in a ball, heard the pilot, co-pilot say, your minimums go around, they hit, pilot, co-pilot killed, navigator badly burned. Uh, the loadmaster rode that cargo all the way up here and walked out through the hole in the side of that thing and said, the commander said, I guess everybody got killed in that one. He said, not me. Colonel, don't notify my next of kin. I'm right here. Four guys walked away from this one because they too, like the others, had heard this pitch. And uh, this Navy pilot, seeing one of my videotapes, said he didn't think much of it, but when his engine quit, he saw the whole thing in instant replay. And uh, they walked away from uh, that mass of uh, wreckage there. And this is a, 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 a ag pilot from Knoxville, a refueler, ag pilot on the side. Uh, engine quit after a pass on a field, uh, went in a pine forest, here's the wings folded behind him, the tail up here, the tail wheel here, walked down it, climbed out of it, no sweat, hitchhiking, trying to go back to town, nobody would pick him up. Luckily he had a, a bracket down there that he hadn't padded up and it gashed his leg a little bit, he got a blood, little blood on there and rubbed it on his face and a bread truck picked him up. So you have to have some some uh, injuries or you may never get back to town. Three guys walked away from this one because they'd heard this pitch. This is my other son, uh, Bill, and he had one gear up, one gear down, broken linkage, uh, called the tower, uh, got a factory on the line, couldn't figure out anything to do, an FAA guy in the tower, the fire trucks out and everything, and nothing to do but land at worst possible condition uh, one gear up and one gear down, and uh, he he uh, was running down that runway. God, I can't I get that thing to work. He was running down that runway uh, before the sparks uh, even settled. <clears throat> this is uh, four guys walked away from this crash of this helicopter because they'd heard this pitch, and they uh, that's the most dangerous operation in the history of aviation, the Army Aviation Operation in uh, Vietnam. They had four accidents uh, to one combat loss. And some of the, some of the combat losses uh, were actually uh, probably accidents. So this memorial to dead crew members here, uh, three out of four of those rows don't have to be there if they practice proper safety procedures. And if they, uh, maybe some of those combat losses weren't there. And if they hadn't, if they'd, uh, been prepared and thought ahead of things. Uh, instead of being on that memorial, they could have been down in Florida fishing with me, and that's the fish that I caught by myself. And if you think I'm bragging, you're absolutely correct. But uh, the purpose of, that's a pretty heavy load of uh, uh, safety propaganda in one package, but I'm always afraid that if uh, I leave something out, that I might leave something out that might save your life. So uh, it's a large dose, but if uh, some people say, well, I, you know, it might inject fear of flying in people. Well, I don't think that would do it at all because uh, all the thousands of hours that airplane been flying, if it, if, you, if it quit a few seconds sooner, it could have stopped on the runway. If it quit a few seconds later, we could have engaged the barrier or maybe stopped on the runway. If it, had, if it uh, or if we'd had enough altitude to eject, or with a, non -ro with a rocket seat, you can eject anywhere except in the hangar, I guess. But uh, uh, all that time, that thing could have quit any time, but where it did. But uh, and then impacting, if, if I had held my head forward, like you're going to do in any kind of an impact, and I talked to a guy over in Austin, Texas, a helicopter pilot driving home for, for his, with his wife after hearing this thing. He says, honey, I still think we're going to go, geez, I can't look. We've got to practice. So they practiced. And uh, uh, about a couple weeks later, drunk jumped the median, hit him head on. Every, everybody went to the hospital or the morgue except the two of them because they braced right away. Or if I'd had a proper fitting helmet, uh, hadn't lost that, and I wouldn't have lost it with my head forward or had a proper padded headrest, I wouldn't have been knocked out. And not being knocked out, I could have gone through that fire uh, with, before it really got lit. And even after it was lit, 
uh, I've talked to firemen who've, who've been in, in uh, chemical plants where a ball of fire came through, you know, they just go down there and hold their breath. The main thing is don't hold your breath or go like this, don't breathe that stuff in. So uh, I hope nothing like this ever happens to you and, and uh, I don't get paid for doing this, but my lecture fee is if any of this ever does you any good, like these others have given me pictures and told about the stories, and I just saw a guy a couple of days ago that it had survived a crash because he had heard it 20 years ago. So if, if it ever does you any good, try and get it back to me or get it in the safety system because I think that's the way to sell safety is to tell people what you did right or what you did wrong. And if they're not going to listen to you when you're trying to save their life, you know, you better get them out of the system or get them off the highway or out of the pattern before they kill us all. So I wish you all the very best of luck. And as far as survival goes, you know, it's essential to uh, have for national survival, we got to have a good, strong military, and we got to have the expense and everything of, of keeping a military establishment today. We can't afford to have accidents, and we want to have everybody uh, in the military survive and help the nation survive. And as far as fear of flying goes, the only thing that really scares me about flying is the drive to the airport. Thank you.